Thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I really uh, am very glad for the opportunity to speak at the conference. Uh, it was a dream of mine for a long time to, to come here and talk. I hope you enjoy the presentation. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you will learn something interesting from this. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, my name is Anton Krosnev. I'm a Java developer with more than 15 years of experience. I, uh, currently, I'm working at Experian. I have uh, three kids. They're all boys, actually. And in my free time, I like to go to the mountains with my bike. Uh, but before I start the tech talk, I would really like to make my use case. So I'm going to show you a project that uses TensorFlow as machine learning algorithm, uh, framework in Java, which is not a very common combination. Uh, I hope you all had lunch, because I'm going to talk a little bit about food right now. <laughs> uh, I really like apples, and um, all the products that, I made, that are made from apples, for instance, uh, apple juice or apple pie, or or uh, Apple Jam, and uh, I was never wondering how these uh, things are made until I saw a movie clip with my kids. Um, so the, I want to share part of it with you, a tiny piece, and uh, it's called Apple Fruit Factory Tour. And this guy here is called Blippi. He is uh, one of the most famous YouTubers for small kids. Um, this clip alone has more than 140 million views. Uh, and uh, it shows uh, what is happening they in an Apple sorted. factory, actually. They get sorted by the ones that look really tasty to eat and ones <laughs> that don't look tasty to eat. So all these apples that get sorted, they go well, on a different converse, they go to different places, and uh, different things are made from them. Uh, but how can we automate this thing and move from uh, this uh, room full of people to uh, this sorting machine? Uh, the sorting machine uses ML uh, computer vision to sort uh, apple in, apples in different categories and um, uh, based on their qualities and good look, uh, some are sent to the uh, store, some are sent to, the, to make juice or apple pie or jam, whatever is suitable for, for this type of apple. Um, so this uh, Apple machine sorts about 2.5 tons of apples per hour, um, which averaging five apples per, per kilogram is like 12,500 apples. And uh, this roughly makes 3.5 apples per second. So we need to process 3.5 uh, images of uh, each apple per second. And uh, this roughly makes 280 milliseconds per image in order to uh, apples to reach uh, the in order classifications uh, for given apple to reach the sorting machine on time. Uh, we really, really need to make this quick. And uh, <clears throat> we, so to facilitate this, we need uh, an ML model that will classify the apples in five or six categories and uh, send this to the sorting machine. So um, how our, our system would look like? By the way, I've uh, participated in a couple of projects similar to this one, so um, I really used, I have seen this in action. And so our uh, system, uh, given this oversimplified architecture, what would it look like? Uh, what uh, it will actually look like? It's uh, this is a, an industrial camera that takes pictures for um, 
uh, in a dim environment, uh, takes pictures very quickly, and it's very robust. Uh, we need a piece of software that will send those pictures to the machine learning model. And when the machine learning model classifies the, the apples into our five or six categories that I mentioned about earlier, uh, it's going to send it to a piece of software that talks to the sorting machine. And we also need to uh, capture the images and uh, the classifications from the ML model and uh, store them in some cloud storage so we can later uh, retrain our model and make it better. Or, for instance, uh, for all the classifications, we can derive some um, statistics and, for instance, present them to business or wherever it's needed to use them for. Um, so our um, ML framework of choice, because there are a lot of, on, of different ML frameworks on the market, but uh, we choose TensorFlow, partly because uh, uh, my colleague, the data scientist, said this is the industry standard in the moment. And the other reason it has a really cool feature that it can support uh, training on distributed environment, which uh, has a couple of machines with a couple of GPUs. And uh, the data scientist can really experiment very quickly with different architectures of the ML model. Um, the, other, the other cool thing about this is it's open source framework, and it's um, created and uh, uh, supported by Google, but also it has a broad community around it. Um, for instance, the GitHub repo, repo of, the, of TensorFlow has more than, um, it's one of the 10 most popular uh, repos in GitHub. Um, so this is our final version of the architecture. Um, so which component should run where? Because uh, yeah, for the camera component, we need something that's really one USB cable away from the camera. And also is the case for the sorting machine. It really needs to be connected to a piece of software that's controlling it via some interface. But uh, for TensorFlow, we have uh, a lot of options run it in the cloud. And that's probably the most obvious choice. Um, you can pick Google Cloud, ML, or Amazon SageMaker, or Azure uh, Machine Learning. Um, but unfortunately, to do that, you need a stable internet connection from your uh, where you consume the, the ML uh, classifications to the cloud. And most of the Apple factories are made in a distant remote locations where the connectivity is quite spotty. It, there are uh, long outages or it's very slow. So um, we decided to make this also on premise because uh, then we can have a reliable um, connection between the ML model and the sorting machine. <clears throat> so we decided to put a couple of servers in the uh, rack of the um, uh, Apple factory. Yeah, this is typical Slavic data center with rack on the <laughs> on the desk. <clears throat> uh, so how do we communicate between the components? Because this four components need to communicate with each other. And uh, the obvious, yeah, maybe these days the obvious choice is REST because, you know, REST, REST is the best. And it has a lot of um, libraries and examples for REST and um, you can easily do something with it. But uh, uh, I have worked on a project that used REST for this uh, type of layout and um, it wasn't very, it wasn't the, the best option, so to say. Uh, the, the reason we used it is because the infrastructure didn't support anything else but REST and um, it had some downsides. For instance, um, uh, it's not very easy to make sure that uh, the camera sends images to 
uh, the ML and to the cloud component. And um, either you have to pipe everything from one to service to another and then do some forks. Uh, and also when the connection is down to the cloud, you need to um, code some uh, storage on disk that will um, be, the images should be stored there until the connection is back online and uh, we can retry to upload them in the cloud. Uh, so uh, we, in the second project that we made, it was possible to use whatever we want, so we picked Kafka. And it has some pos uh, quite a few positives. For instance, it's very easy to send to multiple consumer groups a uh, single message. And um, you don't uh, really have to worry, did that consumer receive that message or did that consumer miss it and needs to retry? It's all Kafka's job. Um, it's also asynchronous by nature. And um, it has some really cool APIs that I'm going to talk in a in a minute about them, uh, that really match very well our use cases here. Uh, the only downside we thought it's um, required, uh, it requires really fast storage in order to work properly. And uh, scaling Kafka cluster is a little bit tedious operation because you need to update the configuration for each other service and specify that there is a new uh, Kafka instance. So this is our final version with uh, the four components and uh, Kafka in the middle to communicate with. Also, there are two Kafka topics. One is for the images, and uh, the other topic is for uh, the ML classifications. Um, so camera will send images, and TensorFlow will read uh, image and produce uh, classification, and then uh, the classification will go to the cloud component and to uh, sorting machine, but also the cloud component will pull images from the image topic and also upload them to the cloud. So what language should we choose for, for these services? Uh, the obvious choice, mm, no, there is no obvious choice, but uh, for instance, uh, Python is the main language for TensorFlow. And um, as you know, Java is for Kafka. So of course, they both have, uh, Python has, um, uh, Kafka has Python API, and uh, uh, TensorFlow has Java API. Um, of course, one can write everything in Python. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that in Java conference. <laughs> Uh, but um, if you do that, you will miss something really cool. And this is uh, the Kafka APIs that uh, comes with the, the Java client. Uh, for instance, our uh, image, uh, image and ML classification uploading component uh, can leverage uh, Kafka connector and use uh, this uh, Kafka connector API and sync you can get uh, a so-called sync that will upload the images and the classifications to the cloud. And they are ready available for, uh, for major cloud providers. You can just pick it off the shelf and configure it. You don't need to write any code for this. And for the camera, uh, uh, well, the, the three brands of uh, industrial cameras that I worked with, uh, they all provide C++ API for Linux which has a Python wrapper on top. And it's really easy to build a service that will capture images and uh, send them somewhere. And having the Kafka Python client, it's a piece of cake. Uh, the other thing about Python is that it has um, a nice variety of image manipulation libraries that uh, run really quickly, because they're usually backed up by uh, native components underneath. Uh, so for TensorFlow, it's not very obvious. <laughs> uh, the default API is Python. 
And in TensorFlow 1.1, Python API looked like this, and Java API looked like something that you built in your garage from scrap. Uh, you almost cannot do anything with it. Uh, and uh, Python API is act was actually, uh, yeah, that was the main API. You can build ML model with it and train it and do whatever you want. I mean, it's very, very powerful. Uh, fortunately, in TensorFlow point, point 2, the API was split in two parts. And um, on top of this small Java API that used to be present, there is a new uh, high-level API that uh, has all the components that uh, Python has. It resembles closely Keras, and uh, you can do anything with it. You can train the model, build new neural, neural network, or uh, everything that's possible with Python. So, um, so we decided to pick Java API, not because it's, we're going to leverage those uh, features, but uh, in order to use Kafka streams, because uh, this really makes it easy to pull, uh, to consume data from one topic and publish it uh, to the other topic. And um, yeah, it does all the heavy lifting for us. It's uh, committing offsets and uh, um, retry and doing retries, and we, it's very convenient to use it. So after we get capture a, a uh, run the, the cloud component, and we are able to capture uh, like um, a couple of thousand images per each category. We can uh, uh, <clears throat> we can start our uh, colleague the the data scientist guy will. Uh, train our model, and uh, then we can build our TensorFlow model that uh, uses the ready-made uh, ML model to classify images. So, <clears throat> but first we need to figure out how to pre-process the image. And this is uh, a step that we usually do in uh, to feed the uh, ML model with the image. So for each pixel of the image. We need to uh, take the uh, red, and red, green, and blue values of the, of the pixel. And uh, because these are our single byte between 0 and 255, we need to uh, convert this in a floating point uh, that's between 0 and 1. And uh, then when all this is done, we build the so-called tensor. That's a huge matrix of all these numbers. And we feed it to the neural network, uh, to the input layer, actually, of the neural network. And when the classification starts, uh, these numbers will flow through different uh, hidden layers of the neural network. And then uh, on the output layer, we will find something, uh, all the different uh, classifications that we had. And for each classification, we will have uh, a number representing uh, how certain the ML model is that uh, this image belongs to, to uh, that class. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to show a, a, a small demo. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Inception V3 ML model that's created and trained by Google because I couldn't find uh, an Apple data set on freely available, so I couldn't train my own uh, ML model. And um, uh, let me switch to see if it's running. OK, so let me zoom that for you. This is my consumer that um, will actually resemble the uh, sorting machine consumer. So. Uh, the payload that it's receiving is an uh, uh, Im image label. That's the classification, actually. Uh, this is one is for pufferfish. And uh, the probability that the ML model has uh, found for this label. And uh, we also receive the 
uh, the time that has elapsed for uh, the image classification. Uh, in the Kafka headers, we have the uh, timestamp when the image was uh, produced, generated, or if it's camera when it's taken. And uh, we have the producer ID that's actually, which is that camera, if we work with multiple cameras, for instance, and multiple sorting machines. Uh, and uh, so having that said, <coughs> uh, let me show you the code. Uh, so, this is our Kafka stream that is really uh, one small class. Uh, uh, it's a, well, yeah, it's a, a Spring Boot service and it's a one small method. And the K stream actually is uh, consuming from the one topic and then we transfer the image to, the, to JSON. And that uh, is uh, then published to the producer topic, the classification topic. And uh, yeah, that's pretty neat. And uh, what happens in the TensorFlow part is a little bit more complex. Not it's that complex, but it's more code. Uh, so we first read the graph from the uh, from the disk and load it as uh, bytes. And uh, with this, we construct the TensorFlow graph, which actually represents the ML model. And <coughs> then when we uh, construct the graph, it's uh, this done by, on the initialization step. Uh, then we can uh, classify our image. But first, we need to build the so-called tensor the huge matrix, and for this thing, we have a, this preprocessing step that actually is uh, uh, doing this uh, stuff. It first decodes the, the JPEG compression of the image, so we get the raw pixels. And then uh, we make batch of one, because we only want to pro classify one image at a time. Uh, and uh, and then we have the size, which is the input size of the, of the neural network, the input layer. And uh, mean and scalar to uh, convert these uh, values to between 0 and 1. And once this is done, we feed that uh, tensor to the, um, mm, to the session that is uh, constructed from our uh, from our graph, and we give it to the input layer of the ML model, and uh, then we fetch the output layer. And this code below uh, extracts the actually the labels that uh, the label that has highest probability, and that's what it's returned by this classification. So let's see how. Uh, this thing performs on my laptop. Uh, I have a sing simple plot that my friend, the, <laughs> the uh, data scientist, gave me. So, Uh, yeah, it parses the logs and uh, draws these graphics. So currently our performance is, isn't that great because we were opting like 280 milliseconds, but most of the uh, classifications and uh, the whole time it took, so it's a, a little bit more. And um, yeah, let's see if we can somehow, what, if we can do something about it. Uh, when I started uh, doing the, the code for the demo, I, uh, my Python was a little bit rusty, so I decided to ask ChatGPT to <laughs> create a Python producer for me, and this is li literally what happened. I had to debug a couple of uh, errors and took <laughs> much longer than if I did it myself with all the reading and uh, 
browsing Stack Overflow. So uh, can we optimize this further? Uh, and I mean not optimize it like throw, throw more hardware at it and uh, make the throughput, uh, make a better throughput with uh, more messages, but how we can optimize the latency that we receive the classification at our uh, sorting machine consumer. So any ideas about this? Sorry? I didn't I didn't understand you. <laughs> okay, so when you start TensorFlow, <laughs> sorry, I, I couldn't understand you. If you can come here and say it a, a little bit clearer. So for currently TensorFlow is running on my CPU, so when it starts it uh, prints a message like that. And uh, what this actually says it's uh, the, the, the binary is not compiled to use these instructions that are available on my CPU. And uh, there is good reason for that because it's compiled to run on older CPUs. So if you have older laptop, you can still start it and run it. Uh, and uh, with AVX2, there might be some boost so we found that uh, benchmark that was deleted from the official documentation, but was still available somewhere in GitHub. And uh, it says that AVX2 will give some boost. I mean, seven images per second, and yeah, this one uh, 40, 42 milliseconds per image. Yeah, so we decided to give it a try. And... Uh, to do that, uh, <coughs> uh, we need to recompile the TensorFlow binary, which turned out to be not that uh, easy task because uh, the TensorFlow binary is built with ba Basel, Basel, uh, like most of the Google components that are on GitHub, and nobody, uh, nobody in the team knew ba uh, anything about Basel, so we had to read and dig and uh, read a lot of scripts and documentation, but eventually we figured out how to do it. And uh, we managed to, to build it, but then was another struggle how to produce uh, Maven, uh, <coughs> Maven artifact that we can use in our Java code easily. But we managed to do that as well, so at the end it was ready, and we deployed it on the first server, and it was running great. And on the second server, this is what happened. It went to crash loop, crash loop with this error message, complaining that the CPU that is running on doesn't have the AVX2 instruction set. It turned out that the second server is a, bit, a little bit older. And we... Uh, went back to using the CPU only version. But then, since the performance wasn't great, we managed to secure additional funding for, the, for hardware, knowing that uh, TensorFlow can run on all these components. Yeah, the first thing is uh, here on the uh, top left is CPU, and uh, bottom left is uh, Raspberry Pi. And this on right down here, this is called a TPU. But unfortunately, it's only available in Google data centers. They claim this is the, the fastest thing to run TensorFlow on. And what we really make sense to get was uh, the GPU, the uh, old graphics card that you have on your gaming laptop. <laughs> uh, so we tried to uh, we wanted to build uh, and run TensorFlow on it. And luckily for me, my uh, uh, oldest son uh, gave me his uh, gaming laptop for this presentation, so I have a GPU on the machine. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> let's uh, try to modify the, our binary. I am going to... I have pre-built that. Uh, I have two Docker images, one with CPU and one with uh, GPU because building it 
takes some time and I don't have it. Uh, so I'm not going to show you how to run Gradle and make new Docker images, but um, we'll just swap this and restart. And then I'll explain how, how, what's needed to, 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 to build the binary. <coughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, 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 I did Java comment, sorry. I'm a bit nervous. Now, it's, now it should be OK. <coughs> Thanks for shouting out. <laughs> OK, so now it's restarted. I'll give you a couple of um, seconds to initialize, and uh, I'm going to show what needed to be changed here. So uh, the first step is, uh, uh, is to re replace uh, TensorFlow implementation, uh, not the Java API that's uh, first thing, that thing here, but uh, uh, the native library implementation. So we change this discriminator to use the GPU at the end, and actually uh, uses a whole different binary for the TensorFlow uh, native part. And once you build uh, your new sp Spring Boot jar, you have to uh, come and rebuild your uh, doc Docker, uh, Docker image. And to do that, uh, you really need to use um, uh, NVIDIA CUDA as a base image. Uh, CUDA is um, floating point uh, mathematical computation library that uh, is developed by NVIDIA and it uh, uses uh, the, mostly the video card and the GPU itself. And uh, once you have built your Docker um, image, you need to uh, also uh, have the GPU driver installed on the host uh, server that runs the Docker container. And uh, you also need to install this uh, uh, Docker runtime container, run, uh, NVIDIA container runtime, which is Docker extension that allows uh, uh, Docker to uh, use the NVIDIA driver. And then you have to instruct the uh, the Docker engine to uh, make the GPU available inside the inside your container. So once all this is done, and ah, just to mention that you cannot use any any version of the CUDA, but it has to strictly match the version of the TensorFlow binary because otherwise it says it cannot find some uh, native libraries or their version mismatch, and it will fall back to CPU. Uh, so let's uh, see if uh, my, my, my image is running. Uh, <clears throat> it's running, yeah. Uh, good sign. It's, there is, it's CUDA is present. So uh, and then you see some, some um, complaints about uh, something missing in my kernel, in my Linux kernel. And uh, hopefully at the end you'll see something like this, that uh, the device, the GPU device is created, and it has that amount of memory, and uh, it's making model. Usually it's only possible to run into it. Uh, I don't know if IT cards are supported now. It was a little bit mm, tricky to run it on the IT GPU. But yeah, it's running right now on my... Um, NVIDIA old GPU, and uh, let's see if the performance has uh, uh, somehow changed. <coughs> um, yep, uh, this, uh, this is the previous run, and then we have this spike because it uh, needed some, mes some messages were delayed while the container is, was restarting, and this is the new output that uh, it's really uh, quite 
lower the latency right now running on the GPU. Uh, so having that said, I really uh, want to, uh, uh, to speak about a little uh, problems that we come come to solve running the uh, the whole thing for a while. And for instance, the configuration of the Kafka topics for the image topic. This is quite unusual configuration. Usually people, uh, when they run Kafka, they want to have exactly once, don't miss any messages and stuff like that. But we, we are kind of OK if uh, some uh, images, for instance, couldn't be uploaded to the cloud. We are still fine. There will be a lot of new images to come, and uh, we'll have enough for model retraining. So we want to keep. Uh, the size of a topic somewhat uh, uh, limited in order not uh, to fill our Kafka storage and have to clean up manually the Kafka servers. Also, the replication factor is one because we decided it's OK if the Kafka node crashes. We'll lose a couple of images, but uh, generally we don't. We lose uh, a couple of images to be sent to the uh, mm, the sorting machine, the classification will be missed, but uh, in general, this can happen. But and using replication factor of one will really uh, uh, will not replicate in across the Kafka cluster, and will give us a little bit of performance boost. And uh, the other thing about the decision topic is uh, that we want to keep the messages there for a really a long time. In order if the, uh, we have some issues with the internet, it will still, hopefully it will be back in two days and then we can upload the small messages into the cloud and not miss any. So our statistics will be uh, relevant and not, we don't miss something. And we also wanted to keep the replication factor uh, for all the Kafka clusters, all, all the nodes in the Kafka cluster, so that uh, if a Kafka node crashes, we still can deliver what it has been processed to the to the sorting machine. Another thing we learned the hard way was uh, the memory usage or memory configuration. When you run uh, TensorFlow, especially with the CPU part, it stores uh, your ML model. It, when it's loaded, it's, uh, it's loaded outside the JVM in the native memory. So if you limit your Docker container, for instance, if you run it in Kubernetes, and you have some limits for the memory of the Docker container, you have to give it enough space for the JVM and for the TensorFlow part where the ML model is loaded. Uh, if you don't do that, you know you, what will happen. Uh, your Docker container will get killed, and <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much all from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll gladly take them. And this is the GitHub repository with the example that I just showed. Sorry? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, in my example, the, the preprocessing happens also in the TensorFlow uh, uh, part where you saw that graph. Let me go back to the, to the code. And uh, yeah, that happens on the preprocessing part. It's also running on the GPU when we switch the processing uh, components. Uh, for instance, when we first uh, built that uh, thing, we, our preprocessing, we did it as pure Java developer, so how do you preprocess that image with AWT, of course, because it's uh, built in the JVM and it's easy to use, and some guys know it. 
So, uh, but the problem with AWT it was uh, that it's not optimized to any CPU or, or let it talk about GPU, of course. And it was actually taking longer, the preprocessing step was taking longer than uh, uh, the uh, ML model classification itself. And it was very inefficient. So that's why we came up with this uh, more obfuscated code that uses TensorFlow to do that. <clears throat> ah, yes. uh, do you send the tensors directly or do you send the JPEG images which you receive? Uh, we uh, built the tensor here in this part. Uh, so the JPEG is decoded and then uh, we built a separate tensor and then this tensor is set to the ML model. You can uh, put that part in, in, in your ML model, build it in, in your architecture of the, the graph there. But uh, usually uh, we don't, didn't do that because we wanted to keep the we wanted to keep them separate, and uh, uh, re really that way you fix, um, yeah, you, um, it's a bit harder to comprehend. Um, no, I, I meant, I meant uh, rather um, you store the images somewhere so you can later uh, request, uh, retrain the model so it can yeah. become better. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you store the, the raw images, which are the, the JPEGs, the uh, undecoded? JPEG, or do you store the uh, tensors? Um, no, no, we store the JPEGs because they use a lot of less space and travel faster through the network. Ah, so the so the JPEGs use less space than the the tensors. Yeah, the JPEG is compressed image and it's uh, very small. Like for instance, these images here I'm using are like 300 kilobytes JPEG, and uh, if you expand that and, and JPEG it, it becomes four megabytes or something like that. Uh -huh, I see. And also, uh, when you uh, used that, uh, what was it, Inception V3 by uh, Google's, uh, this was a, a model which can classify all types of objects, right? So uh, Like a thousand, it has a, a thousand um, different objects can be classified. But uh, for the, uh, the Apple example in particular, uh, uh, something much smaller can be used, right? Because it yeah. only needs... Uh, yeah because it's only apples and it's only one thing in fairly, the scene is fairly concrete. You have a bit of conveyor and well, <laughs> the apple is in the, in the center and it's always like this. It's fairly easy to generalize the ML model on, on this type of images. Also on, uh, on this uh, uh, particular problem, uh, do you, I, uh, this was a real example, right? I'm not digging too deep, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so. Okay, so I was thinking, uh, how do you uh, know that because you only have one image of one side of the apple, uh, do you actually process a couple of images of the apple on each side, and this will take additional time for the classification or only just one side and hope for the best? Yeah, uh, usually to, to make it really useful, you probably need to take two images from two sides. Yeah, or, for instance, you can use some depth, cam depth image of the camera to see if there are bumps on the apples or something like that. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, for the model, uh, in the example, you, you said that um, it was an input layer which you uh, feed for each neuron. It was uh, the values of the pixels, so uh, RGB and you um, normalize it so it's zero to uh, one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, is this uh, inception uh, V3 by uh, Google uh, on this principle, or is it uh, a convolutional network, or? Yeah, it's convolutional network, but uh, yeah, it's uh, the way the model is built, it actually uh, expects values for each pixel to be between zero and one. There are some, I saw uh, different types of neural networks that expect integers, for instance, to, to arrive see. there. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so any more questions? Uh, 
Uh, if there are no more questions, I'll <laughs> stop it, stop my presentation. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>